Thank you for watching part one with Sheila Delaney. This is part two with her. I hope you have enjoyed uh, watching or listening to our conversation. And there are more parts coming up in the next few weeks. Please let me know what you thought of this episode or any other. And don't forget to subscribe, share, rate, and review. Light up with Chua. Let me know. Thank you. That I am part of their story. And that they got a real human mom. <laughs> yeah. There's a meaning to it. Why, that's yes. why you are their mo mother or they are your right. children. Yes. It's not meaningless. That's the thing. Right. There is yes. a purpose for it. Oh, I look forward to so much more conversation about this if yes. we want to do that. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. definitely. Um, yeah, why don't we do it now? Because okay. I'm going to go into the next uh, segment. Uh, sure. So let's, yeah. So go ahead. Well, I was just thinking about this piece, you know, referring to my mom. And give, I'm just going to feel in for a moment. I think, yeah, she would be okay with me sharing the story. We had a, a funny moment as a mom, and this is just four months ago, where I got a very small tattoo on my wrist. Well, I was in England, and I was having quite a profound experience with 10 other women in Glastonbury. And it was, there was a lot of mysticism, there was a lot of presence of the divine feminine, there was, I mean, it was just, it was a transformational kind of event, and to my mind was worth marking my skin for. And my mother and I had such a fascinating conversation because I called to give her the heads up, and I could put it more elegantly, but she kind of freaked out, <laughs> which I knew she would. And I was so curious. I knew that would be true. And I was curious. I said, I don't understand. Like, what is it that's so distressing about this? And mm. she said, well, because I wouldn't do it. You shouldn't do it. <laughs> and it triggered such an interesting conversation where I said, but I'm not you. Well, you're an extension of me. I said, am I? And we thought about it. We, you know, had this really wonderful conversation, like only my mom can show up for. And we ended with, here's where I land, mom, so that you know. You can feel about it however you like, but I claim my sovereignty over my body. And as soon as I said that, she said, you're right. I am glad you are happy with it, and it is your body. And I felt in this moment what I would describe as a really healthy decoupling of that um, confused over identification that can show up in different moments, right? I wouldn't say that's how she parents, but that was a moment. And there was some part of me, the petulant teenage part of me that wanted to say, did it hurt your wrist when the needle stabbed it? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I didn't. And we had this really wonderful conversation, which reminded me this is going to be a lifetime journey of remembering that there are times we will be confused, remembering that even if all goes according to plan, I might be, just because I'm their mother, a primary force in their very first wounding story, you know, in the course of their journey to becoming the best that they can be. There has to be a wounding, to my view. There has to be a portion, something that, that trips them into their journey, the hero's journey or the heroine's journey, as I would say. Mm. And it's usually painful. And it'll probably be me that causes it. And so I really had to, when I realized this, sit very deeply with that, with this deep sense of trust and faith, that that does not have to mean alienation in our relationship. It doesn't have to mean I do something cruel and awful. It does mean that I'll have to be able to forgive myself quickly in the moment, if I have the privilege even of being aware of it, so that I can stay in a relationship. Yeah. Let me pause there. Thank you. Thank you. If only I always did it well, but. Thank you. Wow. My pleasure. Should I move to other sections? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, yeah, I know on every question, there will be something so deep that I won't want to move to the next one. <laughs> it's your show. <laughs> I know. I know, but I do want to get everything as much as I can because these are so important and coming from you is like so meaningful. And because the purpose is to serve and to somebody out there hears this and, you know, doesn't have to even tell me or you just 
this goes somewhere to the right person who needs it at the right time. That's what and my intention is. And my hope that I would add to yours as we put this out into the world, yeah. is it just opens up, even if it just cracks a door of yes. curiosity yes. or wonder or what if, Yeah. then isn't that a gift right there? Exactly. Like just enough to change yeah. the light or change mm -hmm. the view. Yep. Yep. Thank you. And what do you want your children to remember about you? Something that can help them. I hope. I hope that they will see me as a model for taking responsibility for our own journey and our own selves as somebody who could, who was imperfect and more importantly, not pursuing perfection, who could come back and take responsibility and be willing to change her mind, you know, to, so with my kids, when I lay down the law or when there has to be a natural consequence, there's been either a bad decision or just they're figuring something out and the structure suddenly feels really important. If they come to me and make a reasonable case for an alternative, I will always consider it. So if I say no phone for a week and one comes back to me and says, I hear you and I'm going to need my phone because I'm going to be on the bus for this, this and this. Would you consider something else? I will always consider it. Mm. I might not always say yes. Mm. But my hope is that that spirit of being in the world will plant a seed for them. Um, and I hope that they will remember me as loving and open hearted. Um, what I know they will remember is that I cry at Kleenex commercials. <laughs> but do you think that you are, or is there something that you think that you're not and that, but you do want them to remember you? I think that fundamentally I am. And I know that that's how I show up in the world mm -hmm. and it includes my kids. Mm. I think that there have, in fact, we're in a season right now where for me, what I can speak to is over the course of the past year, what are the implications as a mother to drop into something like depression, which mm. I really went into for the first time I, I chose to say, <clears throat> you know, I am depressed and this is not who I am and I don't like how I'm showing up. I don't like my anger. I don't like my, the way I'm expressing what I want or need, I can see myself trying to grasp for control. And that began to impact my parenting, my mm -hmm. relationship. And so really owning the fact, well, a whole bunch of things coming together. Mm. Go ahead. No, yeah. So I, uh, this would be helpful for people who are going through something like this. So maybe you can um, lay it out in from that angle. Uh, so when you are depressed and you have experienced that, then you are, uh, you do you become more of a control freak? That's my flavor. That's your okay. <laughs> that All is right. my flavor. It's not necessary that everybody does that, but some people right. might be doing that. And if if one finds people doing that abnormally, and doing it too much, and then uh, the next thing is, so they can pay attention to it. They must. This person is going through something which is not fitting right with their right with their life or. And I could really feel it, I hope. And, you know, what I have chosen to do, Shwa, is to repeatedly have conversations with my kids. Yeah, so and I wanted you to tell the how, how do you get out of it or how, oh, what's the solution? It. Yeah. So this is yeah. part of it. Yeah. Um, part of it is um, giving myself permission to just be in it hmm. um, and to remember it's, um, that it's not a character flaw oh. to become depressed. Okay. Right. Because dep because I deal so much with emotional fluency and elevating the human experience, I become really grateful for those tools in those moments where I cannot connect in that moment to anything beyond my own frustration or grief or and by depression. For me, what I experienced was a real suppression of mm. motivation, of patience, of willingness, of will. Um, and so what I did repeatedly is I had conversations with my kids to say, I'm in a very strange season and I want you to know it's a season. 
and then this too will pass. And I know that this is hard on you. I want you also to know it's hard on me. And I am not happy with how I'm, you know, how I am all the time. And so there has to be this responsibility where I have to go back and say, I was off the wall last night and I am so sorry. Mm. And also be willing to not hear from them every time. Oh, I forgive you, mom. How can we be more supportive? Mm. (laughs) Because they're teenagers. They're not always equipped for that. And I don't want them to feel that pressure. It's my um, journey, but they're affected by that. And so that's part of it is the staying in communication helped me to stay in connection because I think what happens in the depression is we become isolated Hmm. and we isolate ourselves over and over and over again. So it really was about, I think with depression, the inclination or the drive is to isolate and to go into a cave, go into a hole Hmm. and the discipline for me or the act of faith, if you will, was to reach out to my kids and stay in relationship Hmm. Um, to do the same with my husband, to be talking to them about, frankly, the, you know, perimenopause and hormonal changes and exhaustion and, you know, all of those things that are just real. And as much as we want to, you know, as I think about the maiden mother crone, you know, those transitions as women, we don't talk, we talk about each of them and honoring the maiden and then honoring the mother and then honoring the crone, those transitions in the middle are messy. (laughs) And so really trying to honor that transitional space. And so that was helpful. I'm so glad you mentioned these transitional spaces. Mm -hmm. It's a death, right? I think it is a death of the mother archetype as we move into the crone, or it is a death of a way of being, it is a death of, a, of one flavor of connection to our body. And there, there's rebirth, and we know birth is messy. And that rebirthing of who is the woman yeah. that I claim now, exactly. that I will allow to emerge um, from this messy void, yeah. um, I want to be able to greet her with love. Mm-hmm. I want to be able to greet her with care. I want to be able to greet her with a, a really warm welcome, not running around, sh- you know, shuffling through the shadows, pretending nothing's going on, mm. you know. Um, and so I share that with you. I want to talk about it all the time. As when I came into motherhood, I said, on my watch, no mother does, does this alone. You cannot do motherhood alone. And that will not happen on my watch. I, you know, and now I'm feeling that shift in the same way. And really speaking to the younger women to say, you're beautiful and you're right. And, and your butt's not the same size as it was when it was 22. And that's okay. okay. That's beautiful. Yes, it's not you supposed know? to be. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you're so, right. Yeah, all, all those, that huge long list that comes under this, what you right. just said. Like, Never mind what society and what the, a, a patriarchal structure yeah expects of us as women. And, you know, I feel quite fiercely that I'm going to do this with beauty and grace. And grace itself is sometimes messy, Mm -hmm. right? Mm. So I'm quite inspired. My grandmother, my little Korean grandmother, my Havani, um, kicked and like went into her senior years kicking and screaming. She was still dyeing her hair. Her lipstick was immaculate and her manicure complete always. And... I remember watching her paint her nails and there was this beautiful rich in her eighties, you know, and I think there are beautiful ways to do Mm. all of this. Um, but the transitions have to be permitted, have to be allowed. It's very important. Thank you for, and we have to educate the people in our families. My husband doesn't know beans about it. And why should he? Yep. He has no frame of reference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. like you can repeat it 10 times and it doesn't register and then they're back to the square one and say, and I'm like, didn't I tell you that? Hmm. Right. <laughs> yeah. I have to edit this though. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, I have to That's edit this for now, for now, for now. <laughs> I wouldn't mind to putting this out actually. I'm so out there. <laughs> yeah. Anyways. All right. Um... Would you like to talk about your faith if you are willing to? I don't know if we haven't talked about are you how do you identify yourself as a, a believer, um, Christian? I what do. Are you? 
I am, if anything, if there were a title that suited, Mm -hmm. it might be Pago Christian or Christian Pagan, something like that. Mm. So I was raised in, I should correct that. As a child, I only knew faith. I didn't know even what, where to direct that faith. And it didn't matter to me. I was so in wonder at the world around me, um, at animals with nature. And because we had this cabin out in the interior of British Columbia, Mm. we would be out in the woods and in the mountains and the hills all day long. And we had four distinct seasons. And so there was an honoring of each of the seasons. Mm -hmm. And so I just didn't doubt for a second that there is a wise, divine, benevolent, creative energy to all of it. Hmm. In my teenage years, we found the church. And so we started going to an evangelical church, and part of that was the decision of my parents. And that was the first, if you will, concrete offering to me of what this creator might look like. And so I was like, yes, this makes so much sense to me. And in so many ways, it was a wonderful experience of community, of um, kind of of protection, you know, like because we were all kids of similar values, I actually didn't get into a lot of the difficult predicaments that some of my teenage friends did because mm-hmm. we were just fundamentally doing kind of different things. Mm-hmm. But as I mentioned earlier in my 20s, as I was wrestling with this idea of what is it to be a feminist, which I identified as, I wanted to be, and I wanted my own way of being. You know, I've never very easily bought into other people's definitions. I always needed to find my own. Um, So I would say the church was very helpful, and we had a youth pastor. I was always the problem child in the church because I had very difficult questions. Um, so did you thinking, ask them and oh, did they reply to you or they didn't? Yeah. Okay. We had a youth pastor uh-huh. who always indulged my questions, my curiosity, my conversation. He, I do not remember one time that he pulled rank and just said, because that's what the Bible says. Hmm. He, oh, not one time. Oh, good. He showed up for me in that insatiable curiosity of youth hmm. and met me there. And then I started digging in, and the more and more I looked, I became very tired of not seeing myself in God when I know I am a part of God. I know I am a reflection of God in my feminine form. And I knew as I left high school, I wanted to move into spiritual teaching, and I imagined I wanted to be a pastor. And that's where that was the first time I heard, but you're a girl. Mm. You can't do that. And that shifted so much for me. And I would say that started a path of me um, stepping away from the church more, um, not with hard feelings, mm-hmm. not with, but saying, you know, I know that the masculine face of God is showing up here and I am on a quest for the feminine face of God because I know, I know there are two. In fact, I know it's more, it is not, I, you know, there's not a duality. It's so... Where I've landed um, actually is on a spiritual path that really deeply honors the divine feminine. And this is part of why this Glastonbury experience was such a big deal in that when I was a teenager, I was baptized in the church by immersion. And in the church that I attended, you would give a testimonial. And so you would speak and you would be baptized by by immersion wearing a white robe, Mm -hmm. dipped into the water, and then lifted from the water by the pastor. And it was a very moving, it's a very beautiful experience. When I was in Glastonbury, we went to a place called the White Spring. And it is so rich with the feminine energy. And I really, I don't know if there's a vortex in this space, but the spring itself is located in a, in a grotto or in a large cave that's lit only by candles. There's a gate on the front. And it is a sacred spring to which many people would make a pilgrimage all throughout history. And it's so feminine. You walk in and it's moist and there's, you know, water on the ground and, you know, the walls are a little damp. So you feel like you're in the womb of earth. And tradition says that the waters there are very healing. 
And so you're invited to bathe in this large round pool that's about three feet deep that sits in the middle of this cave. But if you do, you must do so unclothed. So you must strip yourself down. And because it's often open, generally open to the public, you can imagine that doesn't happen quite as often. It still does happen. But we were very fortunate in that as the 10 of us, we had private access. And so each of the 10 of us, we did some ceremony, we did some songs, we had spent some time in ceremony earlier in that day, where we set aside very conscious time to weep for all of the disenfranchised women in the world, to speak for into our prayers, all of the women who weren't able to, all of the women who have been burned at stakes, all of the women who have been shut down, all of the women right now who are being mutilated, who are being suppressed, who, you know, and it was a really moving, I'd never been a part of anything like that. So when I stepped into the white spring and all of us did this, and so we would strip right down and we would hand our clothes to one of our sisters, step down in the spring and do a full immersion, but it's on our own and we lift ourselves up. For me, as I came up out of that water, I felt baptized in the feminine face of God. So now I've been baptized in the masculine face of God and the feminine face of God. And this comes together in this unique and beautiful way that I am still discovering. And so I work with a lot of goddess archetype. I am, I do work with a lot of energy in my practice. My connection happens to be into the emotional field, um, into the heart center. And that's how I coach, even CEOs. That's where I'm leading from. My language might be slightly different, but we're still talking about emotional fluency, about open heartedness. Yeah, we'll about come to what, that for the people okay. who don't understand and Right. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. We'll come to that. Yeah. Um, and so that's where my spirituality is, has led me. So I have a lot of, again, I feel like there's a, there's a parallel in some degree where I often stand, I find myself standing as a bridge between two things, what, you know, Irish and Korean hmm. between the corporate and the soulful. And I stand in this place to say, that these two things overlap like a Venn diagram or the Vesica, Vesica Pisces, right? Um, there's a place in the center where we don't have to live in the extremes at the exclusion of the other. And so that's where I feel like my spirituality is really leading me right now is in this beautiful place where I can have a lot of love and reverence for Jesus and a lot of love and reverence for Kuan Yin. And um, what is Kuan Yin? So she's a Bodhavista. And she is. Is this, is she is this Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox? This is no. East. So, more, my understanding is more Buddhist, but this is where I would oh, have okay. felt her through my Asian lineage hmm. um, on that Korean side where she. So, in some cases, so I think when. I don't remember the whole story well enough to tell it, mm -hmm. but actually, I think she is a masculine form in China, but throughout the rest of Asia, she actually took on a feminine form and she would be a mother Mary energy, very unconditional love, very, um, a hope giver, a life giver. Uh, I really experiencing experience her as a stillness, that deep maternal stillness that can hold space, hold the sacred while I weep and tear my hair and gnash my teeth, hmm. you know? Um, so that's one archetype that comes in. I might have an experience with the archetype of Isis, you know, going through Egyptian. I might, um, and so really all of this feels a discovery. Each one draws something different from me. And so all of those archetypal energies help me to understand some part of myself differently. Wow. Which allows me to offer myself into mm. the world mm. differently. Mm -hmm. Have you been to any um, Middle Eastern countries? I have not. Okay. Any no. Asian other than Korea? You know, have you been to I Korea? I haven't been to Korea. Oh, okay. I haven't. You haven't. So okay. I've been to Europe. I've been to Mexico. I've been, mm -hmm. but I have not. And mm -hmm. you know, my grandmother and my mom and I talked about going, and we didn't get to do it before she mm -hmm. died. And that's definitely something that my mom and I are yeah. talking about right now. Yeah. My stepfather is very ill. Okay. And so the traveling isn't happening so much now, okay. but I, I haven't. And I feel a pilgrimage coming, mm. you know, when there's space, I think both It'll with happen. respect to my kids, because I'm in a stage yep. of life. Yep. Yeah. 
Um, But if I spend too much time in the yearning of that, I would be disconnected from my life. So I offer that to my future self. It's coming. (laughs) I think so too. (laughs) I can see that in your face. I love love it. I think so. (laughs) Where shall we go? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Okay. If it is meant to be, you never know, right? Right. Right. (laughs) Wonderful. Okay. All right. Um, Before I ask you about the healing, more of healing, you did talk about that, but about your uh, emotional fluency, we'll talk about that before I begin into, uh, I get into another section of mine. But uh, um, can you talk about, because you have been into these experiences uh, faith-wise and being, experiencing Southern uh, side of our country and, uh, you know, racism and bigotry and all, whatever you have um, encountered, maybe not directly, but you are aware of it, what exists out there. To help our uh, people today, doesn't matter who is listening, uh, being a white first white woman by color, although the blood is the same. Right. Do you have anything to say to people who are on either extremes, something, a message that Um, some some positive message so that maybe they can think and come to the middle rather than being in the extreme yeah. sides. Either way, um, I don't know if uh, this oh, question just came up. <laughs> there's so much there, so let me just feel into. Yes. Yes. Um, the first thing that comes up, Shwa, is to remember that we are all. What we share in common absolutely is our mother earth, right? Her care, like it's as in a cause in common. And there's something really important about shaking off the arguments, the agony, the, all of those things. And while that is true, so I say that, I think there is a real, really important responsibility that I know I feel as a white passing woman to be an amplifier for the voices of those who don't have the same privilege that I have. So even as a white passing Asian woman, a partial half Asian woman, I cannot without great imagination and education, relate to what it's like to be an African-American woman right now or an African-American man or to be those parents who have to talk to their sons right now about how to handle themselves in a traffic stop with the police and where to put their hands. Like it just, I'm so angry. I'm so outraged about this. And... I feel that we, while I could go to my outrage and that outrage could be polarizing, I think there is a place for righteous rage that we, that unifies us. Mm, righteous rage no? is important. Yep. That it is righteous, that it is not self-righteous, yep. but that it is, I, I, you know, I, you know, I have friends who will say I'm colorblind and these are people I, I, I have great love for. And I say, but you're stripping somebody of their humanity, like of some really essential part of who they are. I'm like the African women, American women I know don't want to be grayed out. Right. I can't imagine you want to be grayed out. My mama has no interest in being grayed out. And that doesn't make sense to me. So I guess what I, all of that to say, if there's a hopeful place that can help with that polarization, Hmm. It might be to say that to take a position on this might be the right thing to do. Thank you for watching part two with Sheila Delaney. I hope you already watched part one with her as well. 
stay tuned for part 3 and let me know what you think of any of these uh, part 1 2 or 3 with Sheila Delaney and send your feedback or comments and let me know if you have watched or listened to any other uh, episode from Light Up Pichwa podcast my name is Shwa and i'm the host and founder of this podcast please uh, go to the website and let me know what you think and what would you like to hear or watch So stay tuned for more interesting and amazing guests and more conversations with Sheila Delaney. Thank you.